the thing that people have got to realise, more than any other DJ, I think Sasha was the first of the superstar DJs. Totally. In Manchester with like, about four or five DJs, you know, we're all mates, we all used to hang out together and we'd all take it in turns on the decks. So I've no idea why I got the acclaim that I did and the others, you know, didn't. I've no, I can't put my finger on why. And then there wasn't probably another superstar DJ until 94 or 95. And the, but the thing is, you've got to remember, Sasha was a guy, a spotty teenager, living in Manchester, who basically come from Bangor. And he was a super, he had this thrust upon him. And this is the days before management teams, PR companies, marketing companies. When it first started happening, after you wrote that awful article about me, <laughs> um, I, it completely freaked me out, you know, to be honest. And I hated it, I really went into my shell, but um, it's, it's, I've been through it for 10 years now. What's so special about the way you play records? Or you know, I've always had my own sound right from the very beginning, but it's always evolved. It's, it's not like I, I, I could say the music I play now has anything, any bearing on what I was doing at Shelley's or what I was doing in Blackburn. You know, you see, I'd say there's a, there is a link in that the music might sound completely different, but the feel of the it, the feel, of, the way I put it together is definitely. You can still, hear a record and go, "That's a Sasha kind yeah, of record." Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's and, and definitely, I mean, when you listen to the Renaissance album, it's definitely much more of a link now mm. you know, because. I think the whole sound that I play now is whatever you want to call it, progressive sound or whatever. It all comes, it all comes from Guerrilla Records when, when progressive, when you first labelled it as progressive. <laughs> That label is stuck and it's kind of the music that I play has definitely evolved from, I mean I can still pull out things like Little Bullet and, yeah. and stuff on Gorilla and it can mix it in with what I'm doing and alright the BPMs are a lot slower back then but sound wise that label pretty much set the precedent. And Gorilla Records was um, a label formed by Willie Morbett and uh, Dick O'Dell and it basically kind of it brought this sound to England that was just a mix of kind of, how was it, it was kind of like breakbeat house with kind of hard sounds, the melodies and everything that kind of musically I, I was just absolutely into and there weren't enough of these records around and you're constantly hearing the odd record and then suddenly this label appeared and it was pretty much guaranteed when I got a Gorilla record through the post it was like I'd be salivating to get it on the deck because it was you, you knew it was like one after another they delivered absolutely wonderful records for a period of about a year and a half two years yeah. what's interesting is um William Morbid kind of took that feel onto his, his um, production on The Last Madonna. Totally, yeah. Yeah, yeah, his sound is like a all light ray of light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was totally influential in, in creating the sound that I now love to play. How do you keep your sanity together when you're bouncing around the world? Right? Um, lost it a couple of times, <laughs> you know. It's, it's, it's difficult when it's, especially because I'm constantly being offered all this fantastic stuff. It's so difficult to turn things down. That's half of the, half of the problem of actually keeping your career going, so knowing what to turn down and when to actually take a break. And it's just like, so you end up just constantly working, and especially if you're sort of going out and, you know, going to after parties and partying as well, you just end up wearing yourself into the ground, especially if you're working in the studio during the week. It can become, you know, the wear and tear on your, on your body and on your head is fairly severe. But um, now, I've moved out, now I've moved out of London, I've kind of got a bit more headspace now. 
I don't really, I've kind of taken myself out of the equation. I don't really have the uh, temptation. Describe what happens when you arrive at a new city and you're, you're due to DJ. It ranges from, um, you know, you sort of arrive on the plane, it ranges from the promoter not turning up at the airport to meet you and you thinking, oh my God, I'm in a completely different time zone. It's Saturday, I can't even speak to anyone back in England. I don't have got an address for the hotel. I've only got a fly for the club or whatever, and going straight to the club and it being that disorganised to, I mean, when I went to Durban, there's like a police escort and it's like they're moving traffic out of the way and ahead I felt like the Queen, you know, and they're like they're stopping traffic and we're going through these cars with sirens and everything. So there's like, they're the two ends of the spectrum, really. but usually it's somewhere in the middle, you know, you just get picked up by the promoter and taken out for dinner, kind of schmooze with the locals and stuff, and then, you know, go to the gig and, if it's, a, if it's somewhere new, usually people are really excited that you're there as well. So, and it's really great, you know, it's, it's like people come up and say, you know, the most sincere and w wonderful things to you, you know, mate, it's like, you know, I haven't even played a record yet and already I've got like, you know, 20, 30 people around me that I'm talking to, it's just like, it's incredible. Why do you think there is this kind of aura about your name as a DJ? There's always this little bit of a kind of thing about a Sasha name, isn't there? Why, why is that? I don't is know. It about what I don't you know play? what it is. I, I've always, I just always try and steer a little bit left. I don't know. I think my my, my alignment's out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I always just always constantly try to evolve what I'm playing. I'm always really thinking about, you know, how how I can move things along and do something different. You know, as soon as I hear other DJs kind of mimicking what I'm doing, it's like, right, I've got to change that, I've got to change that. And um, also as a DJ, every, pretty much every, every time I go out to play, I, can't, I don't really like doing the same set over and over again. Emotive, but I do. I'm very careful about because emotive and cheesy is, is there's such a fine line there, and sometimes you can, you know, you can put a set together, and it, you know, at the end of it, you're like, I didn't really actually need to do those last two records that were that big. I've actually taken a sledgehammer to it when I could have actually just given it a little nudge. What does it feel like when the whole thing is working and say you haven't sledgehammered those last two records in but you're coming up to the peak, every, the whole crowd's going mad, there's people around you going, like, what, is, what does that feel like when you're playing? This is like nothing else on earth, really. I don't really know how to describe it, the buzz I get off that. I mean, I, usually after a set like that where everything's just gone perfectly, the whole club's going crazy, I can't, I can't sleep. It's just like, you know, whether it's six in the morning or nine in the morning or whatever, it's like I go back to my hotel and even if I've got, you know, I haven't even drunk or anything and I'm completely sober, which is very, fairly rare, but <laughs> even if that happens, I'll lie in my hotel room with adrenaline pumping around my system and I won't be able to sleep all day. The buzz I get out of DJ is being able to do something spontaneous and just, you know, and sometimes it goes wrong. Sometimes I can have a night where I just don't get it together, but I'd rather actually have that, I'd rather have that and take that chance than just be somebody who just plays the same, same records every week. And, you know, I'd rather have the odd bad night and, you know, just take, take, you know, take some criticism on the chin, just so I can, you know, just in case on the other night, you know, I might be able to do something that's really, you know, fantastic and awe-inspiring and just, you know, if I'm buzzing in the DJ box, it usually means club is so I'm constantly thinking about what sounds are going to work with what sounds and also about building an, an energy keeping the energy levels in the club going it's almost like putting layers a layer upon a layer each record is another layer and build you know, you're building the energy up in the room and keeping people on the dance floor and just creating this tension and energy in the room, which 
obviously if you don't know your record sometimes you can mess up and then you kind of have to step back a few and but if you're playing a great set then it is a constant just layering process and you just build build up and up and then um, yeah it's just you know I'm always listening for sounds that will work together and, and just melodies that might work, interact with each other and stuff like that and, What is your musical training? I just learned the piano when I was a kid, basically. And, but then I stopped when I was like 16, and then um, I didn't, you know, I never wanted to touch it again, because it was this whole battle I had going on with my stepmother. She wanted me to play the piano, I didn't want that. And it was this constant battle to get me to play. It wasn't like I wanted to be a musician. And then suddenly I'm like 19, I'm in a studio, and there's a keyboard in front of me, and I'm like, I can play. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, if I'm the right. like, Thanks very much for that, <laughs> forcing me to play the piano for all those years. Actually, I'm actually putting it to use. So, is there a global underground? I think there is. It's very difficult to spot it in England because everything's become so commercialised and mainstream. But there is. You're talking about pockets of people who all like the music in different cities. Yeah, like totally. Yeah, there's people all over the world that are into the same kind of sounds, you know. And it's. Just, I go to Port Douglas away on holiday. I'm thinking I'm going to find the quietest, most remote little town on the planet, so I think Port Douglas, right next to the Barrier Reef, perfect. I go away up there, learn how to dive, but over, over the course of the two weeks that I'm there, obviously I get to know pretty much everyone in this town. Uh, on the last night as a going away present for them, <laughs> they asked me to play a party for them, so I ended up DJing <laughs> in Port Douglas in their only club. They shipped up a sound system from Cairns, and everyone's got their tops off, they're all jumping around, a deck set up on a pool table, and I was just thinking, I can't believe this. I've come to where have I got to go? I've got to go to I don't know some lake in the middle of Africa just to get away from it. I'm sure somebody had tracked me down. <laughs> oh, you play records, wicked. <laughs>